Hi, welcome. Um, so, logistically, we have uh, people coming into our committee downstairs uh, at 1030. They conveniently happen to be the same people who were staffing us in this committee. Um, Damien and Joyce, I hope Joyce will be here as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do to start off is have Damien uh, highlight the differences uh, between what we sent over in our last version to the House and what the House sent over to us in their last version. This is what they have. Great. Okay. Oh, thank you. Perfect. That'll save you. Yep. So if you go to uh, the sheet labeled Summary of Changes to H107, right. a short two-pager, this is probably the quickest summary of the differences between the two bills. Um, and then you've also got this giant chart here, which if you fold it over, the oh, last two columns, Oh, we have like micro no, you, can't, you can't do it. I'll, I'll get to it. Here we go. This, We're all on my Google Highway. Here. <laughs> yeah, so um, it, it's legible on 11 by 17. I promise. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Only when you did um, But it, if you take a look at it, um, the furthest two columns to the right show the key components of each bill. Um, and then all the other columns are existing laws in other states. So to get you through the, the kind of the key points, so the changes, this says summary of changes to H107. It means changes from the House uh, to the Senate. So in the Senate, uh, they've gone to 12 weeks for bonding, eight weeks for family care, and a six-week voluntary opt-in benefits for the employee's own illness, what we often call TDI. Uh, and that's in comparison to the House, which was 12 for bonding and 8 for family care and TDI. Um, and the TDI is automatic, not often. Uh, the next. So, so people, I think, should feel free to ask questions as we go. Uh, and I have one with um, the 12 weeks that the House has for uh, parental leave. How does that, does that differ between a couple and an individual? It does not. Uh, so in the house, it is 12 weeks um, for any employee. So any qualified employee gets up to 12 weeks for bonding, regardless so, of whether they're a single parent or a two-parent household. So a two-parent household could get up to 24 weeks total? Yes. OK. And ours? was, I thought we were at 16 weeks. You, you are. That's what those two double crosses there lead to a footnote. If you notice, um, if you look at the back, if you look at micro the microprint. Exactly what you're going to say. You can just kind of faith is getting it to us. We'll, um, we'll be able to see it in a minute. Yeah. Oh so my god, that's It's super slightly cool. larger than the print that's on your check as a security feature. <laughs> so, but smaller um, than our double opt-in. Yeah. But anyway, there, as you can see, there's Literally, there are so many little nuances to yeah. these family leave bills. I don't know. I've run out of symbols, basically, okay. for footnotes. Um, and so, and so, just We're getting there. And just if I may, um, just if we can have a, a quick, dis, uh, quick explanation from the Senate, just about their thinking about the voluntary portion of TDI. Um, we made it mandatory. Uh, and included a tax rate that in, that included that as a mandatory issue, and um, and the Senate just returned the uh, voluntary w with a separate tax contribution, contribution estimate um, as well. So can you just tell me well, the thinking was, in the Senate it, about that? This primarily had to do with the cost of the payroll tax uh, and. We tried to figure out ways to keep that cost down somewhat, and we learned that there were uh, a significant number, I think the percentage, I've heard 40 to 50% of Vermont workers already have TDI, 
and it's probably better TDI than what was proposed in the House version, and it's paid for by the employer. And um, so, but I'd say primarily, in all honesty, it was the uh, impacting the contribution rate. Okay, and um, uh, does anyone do, before before Damien moves on, does anybody else have questions? I will probably deny at the moment. Okay, so. Um, so it was, it was, it was a finance, I mean, it was basically, in a, the goal was to see what size program yeah, you could get it for. Basically, it, it was an expensive benefit, and when we, I guess both sides left the option of some sort of sharing between employer and employee and stuck it all on the employee, uh, we felt like we wanted to lower that cost to the employee, and we, and this was a, uh, an expensive benefit for the employee, and uh, a lot of employees already had it. So we thought, you know, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, personally, of TDI, but given the realistic realism of the our body and where we were, um, this is something that we had to <coughs> not really agree to. So, um, so I still don't see, where it says 16 weeks. Is it in one of these? It is in one, one of the footnotes. Here, it, it's it's laid out. Maybe they have the wrong code here. Oh, I see. I yeah. got Double cross, I see. Double cross, yeah. Oh, oh, double double cross. Cross. What does that mean? Double what is Damien's signal? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Believe me, there is nothing <laughs> under the surface here, guys. I am skin deep. <laughs> <laughs> isn't that like Ray's lightsaber in Star Wars? Oh, <laughs> um, wow. Deep cuts this morning. All right. Um, so it is in much more legible print on your summary of changes, and we talk about it towards the bottom of the page. So I'll, I'll get there in just a minute. The other kind of key difference um, that is kind of the headline difference is just the difference in the contribution rates. So, and you were just touching on that. Uh, the base contribution rate under the Senate plan is 0.2%, and for those who opt into TDI, there's an additional 0.38%. So you get to a total of 0.58% of the taxable wages. The contribution rate on the house plan is 0.55% for everything. Uh, the reason that you see the large, uh, the slightly larger rate for the voluntary opt-in is because you'll have self-selection in that pool. Mm -hmm. um, so folks who want that benefit are going to be in a smaller insurance right. pool, so they're going to pay a little bit more for that. Um, is that premised on uh, a number that JFO has come up with, a voluntary participation rate? Yeah. So. Uh, and this is something that Joyce is better to talk about, but uh, Joyce, what she did is she looked at um, studies that attempted to sort of model voluntary participation mm -hmm. and then built that into the projected costs mm -hmm. um, and the projected incidence of use and so forth. And so you will have more people participating than actually use the benefit. Um, but the ratio between those is closer than it would be in the broader pool, so people pay a little bit more for that benefit. Um, but the base benefit cost um, diminishes significantly because TDI is the biggest driver um, of that cost. Um, just one, Faith, did, has Joyce been notified to come up? Yes, she has. I haven't heard from her. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh, Damien, did we ever actually get a, 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 a projected percent of the company of the number of businesses that provide the TDI in the state? Mm -hmm. uh, so there is data on that. Um, Just not from memory. <coughs> what the percent was. There, there is data on that from the 2013 Department of Labor Fringe Benefits Study, and there's national data. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this summer when the, the labor market information did their fringe benefit study, they were looking at different benefits mm -hmm. this time around. Um, so they were looking at um, sort of more uh, workplace wellness benefits uh, that promote 
kind of healthy individuals rather than looking at um, leave, which was their big focus in their last um, last time they did that. And because they're a small shop, it's not a study that they're able to do very frequently. We have some national data on that. Um, the numbers around that uh, tend to skew so that uh, you see more instances of short-term disability is really what we're talking about, um, where there's short-term disability insurance provided at larger employers than at smaller employers. Um, but there are folks who enroll in the individual market. Um, one of the things that we don't have good data on is what, are, what is the average short-term disability policy cover? Um, because that can vary by employer. Some of them cover parental leave, others um, may have different benefits. Some of them require you to be out of work for a certain period of time, others start right away. Um, Some require that you exhaust all your other options. Right, so there, um, and unfortunately, most of this is tapped to the larger US where you know, for Vermont, a large employer is an employer with 50 or more. In most other states, that's someone who's low to mid-sized in terms of uh, size. So our, our ratio of small employers would be, um, it's just off the charts compared to some other states. Yeah. So, um, but then if you look at percentages of people employed, the numbers come a little closer. And that, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, and no, you follow and I'll go after you because I think you're following this then. No. Okay. I see. Go All right. Ahead. So uh, the other the other part is, as I understand it, I mean, and I think this was still maybe you're going to get to it, but while we're on TDI, um, the uh, if an employer is currently offering TDI, they uh, and it's an equal or more generous benefit than what this program would be, then they can opt out and continue to offer their own programs. So it, there's actually no change for those employees. Is that correct? Right. Uh, almost. Okay. So um, if, an if an employer is currently offering a short, uh, a paid family leave benefit, um, I'm just going to use that as sort of the umbrella right. term. So they cover bonding, family care, and then for purposes of the Senate bill, um, they either offer automatic coverage for your own disability or they offer opt-in coverage for it. They would be able to continue offering that provided their benefits are roughly equivalent or more yeah. generous than. Um, the House bill, you have to offer all three because they're mandatory in the House bill. Right. Um, so they're, but if you've already got that plan, the, the sort of base point of if you right. already have a leave plan as an employer, right. you can opt to keep that and opt out of the state plan. Right. Uh, right. It still holds true. Right, OK. Because I think that was part of our intent, was to not make it more difficult for those employers that were already doing right. things Right, and that, I think, is something that it's safe to say both chambers yeah. agree on. OK. Um, so okay. did um, the calculation in the House on TDI of um, whatever the, the amount added to it, did that include an analysis that certain employers would opt out of this system and and people would not have to buy TDI? That's a better question for Joyce. I don't, mm -hmm. don't know how she factored that in. Um, on the uh, Senate version, and I'll admit that you know it's been a while since I've really been deeply in the weeds in this. Um, is if somebody wants to uh, opt into TDI mm -hmm. in the Senate version and pay an extra contribution rate, um, can they do that on an individual basis, or does their employer have to? sign the entire workforce of that employer up for it. It's an employee by employee. It's it's a it's on the employee basis. So the, the choice is for employees. The only exception to that would be if the employer is offering their own private plan, the employer can either choose to enroll everybody in TDI or allow people to opt in on an individual basis. And just to just to be clear, compared to other um, 
employee leave programs or injury programs, um, businesses cannot opt out of workers' compensation. We don't opt out. We don't have an opt out provision for unemployment insurance. Um, and I mean, those are the two. Those are the two paid insurance, different kinds of insurance programs. But we don't offer. The law does not offer opt outs for those. So, uh, yeah. So to be clear, um, unemployment insurance is entirely public. So uh, everybody, every employer in the state, for their covered employees, pays into the unemployment insurance pool, or in isolated instances. Um, for, uh, for example, the state government, you reimburse for the costs. But either way, you're paying into the same pool. With workers' comp, there is a mandate that you provide coverage, but the coverage is provided through private insurance companies. The Department of Labor, Department of Financial Regulation, doesn't actually create the insurance product. Um, they just regulate the two different sides of that. Department of Financial Regulation does the insurance end, Labor works on the claims end, where folks are trying to get back to work. Um, and so there, uh, you basically have to provide coverage, but you can shop around in the market. And for employers who uh, are in an industry where it's difficult to get coverage, there is what's called an assigned, um, I think it's assigned benefit market. I should have Mike Pichak here. <laughs> to correct me, um, but it, it's basically uh, all insurance carriers are required to cover uh, employers from this market. They're the they're the folks that people don't want to cover because they're high risk or they have a low uh, experience history. So they're kind of the risk is questionable, and so there's a pool that they uh, the assigned risk pool that they get put into, and then that's covered kind of on a, a pool basis by the insurance carriers that are in the market, but it's still not a public product. There's only one state I know of that does public workers' comp, and there may be others, but the only one that I know of is North Dakota. Um, so in most states, it's done through private insurance carriers. Um, so that that's a, a kind of, neither one is an apples to apples comparison to this, which combines a public program with a likely private administrator of that program, as well as the option to get private insurance. Um, California and New Jersey both have a public program with the option to get private insurance, and they've had that for a while. Um, so this is not a, a new proposal. Um, the difference in Vermont's proposal is that uh, this proposal contemplates getting a private administrator for the public pool as well. Right. So. And, and just one last, one last time, I just want to be conscious of the time as well, but the idea that um, insurance can be experience-based, whereas if you use it, your rates go up, and this is not in that category. These are fixed benefits, like the most at 73, whatever this number is, I think, mm -hmm. it's, I think we, we testified earlier this last week of that it's at 73,000, that's the, that's the cap. That's where we get to the nine, at least in the Senate's provision, which is 964 a week. So a person can't claim more than 964 times 12 for, for bonding. And, it's, and if they do, they're not going to be charged next year a higher rate like we would right. do for auto insurance or for unemployment insurance or for, mm -hmm. you know, where people are charged more for using insurance. This is just fixed, right? Yes, uh, it is fix the charges to the employees provided you're in the public plan. Um, the, if you're an employer going into a private plan, you'll shop around, you may get a better rate with one insurance carrier than another. Um, the other thing to note is there is some experience built into this, but it doesn't change charges on kind of like a small group by small group basis. The charges might change on a statewide basis. So if utilization is higher than projected, the rates might go up. If it's lower than projected, the rates might go down. The same token, as the program gets more established, you might see um, what other states have experienced where their rates kind of settle out after um, several years. 
Um, as the experience gets established, the projections get established, you get a sort of an ability to project what's going to come in the state and figure out benefits and so forth. Um, Dion. Um, can you talk about, and maybe this is beyond your expertise, but how the Department of Regulations currently regulates the um, workers' compensation insurance? Uh, so that is, it, it's pretty complicated, um, but I'll, I'll kind of try to do it on the very sort of 15,000 foot view that I understand it at. Um, so basically, um, the way workers' comp works is there are um, sort of uh, occupational categories. So for example, office workers, roofers, loggers, um, uh, wood manufacturing, truckers, those are all different occupational categories. Depending on the category, you may have very low risk of workplace injury, for example, an office worker. Um, and whereas a roofer or a logger might have a very high risk of an occupational injury. Um, and so the rates within the occupations are based on the risk of injury within that occupation. Um, and so there's sort of a base rate that's set. The rate is set between the Department of Financial Regulation and then a national body that kind of accumulates data on injury and risk. Um, and I am forgetting their name at the moment. Um, I wasn't really... CCI? Yes, yes, thank you. I wasn't really coming in prepared to talk about workers' comp this morning. <laughs> but yeah, so NCCI comes out with rates, uh, proposed rates each year. Department of Financial Regulation approves them. They get rolled into the policies. You may see your rates at individual employers go up or down based on that employer's experience. So employers can lower their rates by having good safety practices and avoiding injuries. Um, and so, but the, the base rates are sort of set there and then they get put out by the insurance carriers. Uh, in some industries, there are safety programs to help lower rates. Um, so if you get your employees to go through training, your insurance carrier may agree to reduce your rate slightly. Um, and your rates are based on your overall payroll um, for each sort of occupation. So you can imagine a roofing company it's a large enough company, may have two or three office workers, and then 20 roofers who go out in the field, they may have a truck driver, that sort of thing. And so each of those will see a different rate, and then their policy will kind of um, be a, a mix of those rates put together. Um, so it's a little different than this, where what this is, is it's more modeled on income tax withholding. <coughs> with a tax rate that may vary from year to year based on sort of the state's experience. And the reason I say it's based on income tax withholding is if uh, you'll think back to your W-4s and your I-9s when you start a job, you can elect to have higher withholding. Um, so for example, someone like me where my wife is, uh, she's self-employed, um, so we may want to try to offset her tax burden by doing higher withholding through my mm -hmm. income here. That's something we could opt to do. Um, so in, by the same token, under the Senate plan, you have individuals who can opt for the higher withholding rate in order to get <coughs> TDI coverage. Under the House plan, there's one withholding rate for everyone. So does that make sense? Okay. A little follow up on that and, and a little bit back to the experience, and this may be more of a Joyce question than a question for you. Um, I think some of our thinking around the, the TDI, it, it, the, the notion of the opt-in, um, is there a concern about, or maybe there was in the Senate or not, about adverse selection? And so people who want it, who know they're going to need it, mm -hmm. or are likely to need it, will opt in, which means that a higher percentage of people will use it, so right. the usage rate goes up and the costs go up over time, which makes it maybe less desirable for people to opt in as the costs go up. So I'm wondering if there was any discussion about that in the Senate or whether Joyce has any other thoughts on that. So just one thing to note on that is the Senate did build in a sort of safety protection on that, where there's a three-year, if you opt in, it's for yes. three years. Um, so for example, if I know I might be having surgery in the next mm -hmm. year, I might want to opt into TDI coverage. 
but I can't jump back okay. out of coverage as soon as I recover. Yep. Um, so I'm stuck for three years, and then after that, it's like your health insurance where there's an annual enrollment period mm -hmm. where you can either enroll or uh, enroll or disenroll. Right. Um, but if you choose not to disenroll, you're on it for another 12 months until the next period comes right. to, to opt out of the coverage, and that provides some safety. I think Joyce can talk to you more about the sort of adverse selection, but the Senate did sort of consider that issue of people okay. sort of jumping on just when they need right. it, which would make for a, probably an unsustainable product, right. versus doing this three-year period here where you, you realize when you're opting in that you're going to be paying in for right. several years. Okay. And, and that'll be true every time. When you renew, it's not for one year, it's for three years. No, it's a one-year renewal after no, three I, years. I think it does. But it's, yeah. That makes more sense to stay for a period of three years right. to even it all out. Thank you. Okay, we're. Um, <laughs> you guys have to go. You guys have to go at ten thirty. We have to go at ten thirty. We can stay a little later because our two witnesses are in the room here, but <laughs> and three of us are on the committee. But um, so, let's see if we can get through the okay. at least the differences here. So um, let me try to zip through this. So in the definition section, the Senate bill added. Um, uh, coverage for family care for the employee's sibling. Um, it also added the definition of family care because of the differentiation between TDI and family care. And it replaced the definition of the Vermont livable wage with the definition for the Vermont average weekly wage, which tracks the average weekly wage that we also use in UI and workers' comp. Um, the, uh, the next piece in the actual program uh, it adds a requirement um, that the contract with the insurance carrier can be reopened if coverage for the employee's own illness becomes mandatory, and it also requires an annual audit of the insurance carrier. Um, uh, Representative, um, is that okay if we have a question? Um, so, looking at the annual audit insurance carrier, can you just talk through about what the specifics are and detail about that? So, the, the provision requires that the insurance carrier have an annual audit performed and that the results of the audit be provided to the Commissioner of Financial Regulation. Um, I think the idea here is to make sure that the, um, that it's basically an audit of the books and all the accounts and statements related to, um, the numbers basically related to this insurance program to make sure that the insurance carrier is operating it in a sustainable manner. Um, and then the Commissioner of Financial Regulation has the opportunity to review that so that if there is an issue detected, there's oversight at the state level. Um, so, yeah. Yes. Sure. Will, will that also include the number of claims denied or grievances or things like that? Is there going to be some report around that? I don't recall that language being in that particular piece. Um, I'd have to look at the bill language okay. just to check on that. Well, we'll um, assume that. I mean, uh, given it's I specific think, to this program and specific to Vermont. So I, don't I can get back to you the next time we come yeah, back. Yeah, okay. Because it, it'll take me up. I think that's important to, to know that that's actually going to happen as opposed to the financial health of the insurance company, which is what I think DFR is looking at. Yes. Well, their, their ability to provide the service, no. right? Yeah. Right. That data. All right. So I put that in as a question, and I will Thank follow you. up the next okay. time we meet. Um, the. Oh, sorry, it kind of yep. In that, um, if there's uh, not just claims denied, but if there's anything about grievance grievances of if there is a claim denied, kind of what that. So there is an appeals be. process built okay. into both bills, both the House and the Senate, um, and the Senate. Uh, um, made some changes to that process, and it's on the second page here, okay. so we'll get there in just a second. Um, the, let's see, on the contributions, we've already talked about the rates, um, and again, the employee pays the contributions, but the employer can elect to pay some or all of the contributions, just like in the House. It's only on this summary of changes because this is a question that everyone asks, because the Senate did discuss a split between them with the final version. Um, came out with the same as the House. 
the benefits. So we've talked about the overall numbers. A couple of caveats here. The Senate, as we mentioned earlier, has the combined total of 16 weeks per calendar year if both parents are eligible to use the bonding leave benefits. So in other words, uh, you take a two-parent household, um, the two parents combined can use up to 16 weeks of bonding leave. Under the Senate plan, under the House plan, they could use up to 24 weeks. Uh, single parent is limited to 12 under both plans. So individual employee gets 12 weeks. The difference with the Senate is that they look at your house overall. So you could have one parent use 12 weeks and then the other use four. Um, or any other combination that gets to 16. The other caveat in the- I, I just want to mention that I asked Joyce to run the numbers on the House versus the Senate proposal there. And she says the contribution rate wouldn't change. Stay about the same. It's an equity of 12 and 12. Yeah. So the other caveat here is that there is a limit to a combined total of six weeks per calendar year to care for a sibling or grandparent of one or more qualified employees. Under the Senate version, the House does not cover care for siblings. Um, so it's basically you've added an additional six weeks of family care for siblings under the Senate version. Um, and then added a combined total limit for grandparents. Um, but it's not adding, it's, it's just adding the category, not adding, adding the weeks. For grandparents, not adding right. weeks, just right. adding the cap. And, and so the qualifications work in, that's on a rolling calendar year, but this is, that's on a rolling 12 month period, but this is for a calendar year, January 1 to January 1, bookkeeping issue? Yeah, so, uh, if you'll remember, the the benefits here are on a calendar year basis um, in the bill. So, yep. yeah, this is per calendar year. Yep. So, okay. there is the potential that you could have a rollover there at, at the new year. But the qualification, Same. if I get hired in March, I have to find I can't qualify until I until I meet the financial and the time requirements, um, yes. which could be March of the following year. Or it could be six months from then. It, it, right. 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 So it's it's a minimum of two calendar quarters um, yep. that you need of employment, and then a minimum of about 11400 I think, yep. under the current minimum wage. OK. Um, so the other changes here is the wage replacement um, changed. So under the House's version, it was 90% of the employees week our, uh, weekly wages up to the Vermont weekly livable wage, and then 50% of the wages above that to a cap of $1,334 a week. Um, the Senate's version is 90% of the wages up to 55% of the Vermont average weekly wage, and then 55% of the wages above that up to a cap of the Vermont average weekly wage, which is currently $964 a week. So lower cap, um, but somewhat steeper wage replacement when you get above that break point. Um, so the, the cutoffs there, just for some dollar figures here, you're at 90% of your wages up to 530 a week, and then 55% until you hit the cap at 964 under the Senate proposal. And the Vermont average weekly wage was gone to because uh, the livable wage, as you all know, is determined by JFO. It's based on a rough formula, but that formula changes um, over time. And so you sometimes see fluctuations where it might spike one year. Um, and whereas the Vermont average weekly wage is tracked by the Department of Labor based on all of their accumulated wage data, uh, and it's a standard measure that we use, like I mentioned before, in workers' comp and UI. So this ties us to something that, again, is, is more of a standard number. Questions? Is there a, um, on the Senate version, is there a, uh, a dollar figure, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say, between the two versions, is there a, a wage, uh, an earning level where, um, a, a Vermonter would do better under the Senate version versus the House version? Is there like a place where they cross because of the nut? I don't know. Um, I can figure that out. 
Okay. It's not that important. I think they're close. But. So the average. I, I mean, one of our goals here was to, I think, to give a greater percentage of wage replacement to lower income workers. I, I mean, I think I can speak for the committee that when we did hear this, we found this most reasonable. You know, because I mean, and especially, I mean, obviously we like. We liked our bigger number, but I think that this gets at a, a more solid way of computing that number, and it provides. I mean, I, I believe 964 um, provides the full benefit. Like, like 964 would represent exactly the formula that you put forward up to a salary of roughly 73 or 74 thousand dollars a year, which is. Um, uh, I don't think it's the median. It's not the median wage, but it's, but it's yeah. it's. In Washington County, anyway, it's considered a little bit more than a livable wage, um, kind of thing. So we found that okay. we found that a reasonable alternative to what we were doing. Let me, yeah. just, let me just interrupt for a second. Faith, can you mm -hmm. uh, guys, uh, someone go downstairs, and we're going to cancel the S23 hearing, and we'll finish. We'll apply another half hour here. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Can we push our hearing to 11 instead? No, because we have somebody coming in in the morning. It's Doug coming in the Okay. So we'll just do minimum wage some other time. Okay. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the next uh, changes here in the alternative insurance of benefits plans, the only change was that um, because of the TDI opt-in under the Senate plan, the employer now has two options. Either if they do a private plan, they either provide automatic coverage for TDI to all employees, or they allow employees to opt in. Um, either one of those complies with the requirements. But that's the the only uh, change there. And, and Damien, can I uh, just? I'm not sure if this is tangential or not. But back on your on your spreadsheet, mm -hmm. it, it it speaks to the the concept of having a private administrator for a public plan versus a pub a public ramp up, um, a statewide ramp up or a state's ramp up for this, is that when we we have this under um, under the effective dates on your spreadsheet, it talks about or the ramp you know the beginning date it says tax begins on <coughs> April 1, 2020, and then benefits become. Be, begin in October 1, 2020. Those dates need to change. Though, well, they need to change anyway, but they need to change. Well, not, they need to change because it's next year. But right. but the question here is this: these are based on an assumption that this is a private plan based on the information that was in the RFI, which said that a, that a private insurance company wouldn't require the 12 or 15 months of collecting benefits to create the pool, that they would automatically have the pool ready so that our program is merely, it's a software issue that's rather than a collection of trust fund issues. Is that, is that, because everybody else here is like, you know, everybody else here yes. taxes, and in our, in our Republic bill, when we've considered it in the past, has always been, we assume that there's 15 months or so of a collection. right? Um, so that, I just want to make sure that that's, that's what that meant. Yes, so that, that's because um, of the, the nature of the private plan. Um, there's a little bit of pay-in ahead of time, but uh, the, uh, they don't, the presumption is that a private insurance company, this is going to be one of many products they offer. They don't need to build up the reserve because they're already carrying a large reserve for all of their products. Um, so they're going to budget when they do their when they do their RFP um, or their their proposal in response to the RFP. Uh, they're basically going to give the state a quote that includes um, a carrying charge that helps feed that reserve uh, and maintain their solvency. So they're. I think the way to think about it is with a private administrator, you pay over time. With the state, you need to take that time ahead of time to build up the six or nine or 12 months reserve. Um, so that, that's what you see in those differences. And we would be the first state, um, no, we would be the second state probably to do this because Connecticut is contemplating something similar, although Connecticut's has some twists on it too. So. Um, but but they, the presumption, the presumption is that 
the presumption is that this is with a private plan. If, according to the bill, there's the if if when the time comes to choose the plan mm -hmm. or choose the, the the way we're going, DFR and DOL and Human Resources are going to tell us that they studied these plans, and if they come down on the side of saying, "Oh, you know what, a private a public plan is going to be more cost effective and a better better thing for the, for Vermonters," that timeline changes completely. Yes, and that is addressed in some changes that the Senate made in the effective date section. Um, the House bill had a date for the Commissioner of Labor to report back on a plan to stand up the program. Um, and the Senate bill, if I remember correctly, has given the Commissioner of Labor an additional month and then also created a timeline for when taxes start being collected and so forth. The House uh, bill, the assumption, if I'm recalling testimony and committee correctly, was that if we get to that point, we're going to be coming back to readdress this in legislation, so we'll establish the appropriate timeline then, um, because the, the deadlines would still be give you a year, um, or a, not a year, but a legislative session to push those deadlines out. Yeah. So, so the bottom line is that by using a private plan, employees and workers will be able to access benefits more quickly than if we do a state-run plan, which will take longer by probably about a year um, before people could actually access benefits. Yeah, by, by at least a year. Yes, yeah. Yeah. a year or more. Yes. So they get it faster this way. So, I mean, that's, that's the plus. That is that's, plus. That's I a, just want to be clear about that. That's a plus of, of yes. all the pluses and, and minuses we're that we're contemplating. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so 577A is a new section in the Senate bill. Uh, it is, is long and involved, but the bottom line with it is this establishes the process for an employee to opt in and opt out of the voluntary TDI program. So it includes, as I mentioned earlier, the whole three-year requirement for the initial opt-in, the one-year renewals after that, the uh, annual period when employees can opt in or out, all of that's covered. It covers a uh, few pages, but the bottom line is it's, it's setting that up. And for the House members, it's based very closely on the opt-in and opt-out that you had for self-employed uh, individuals that came out of the House General Committee and was eventually dropped from the bill. Um, so it's, it's not an unfamiliar uh, process. It's just designed around employees rather than self-employed individuals. Sorry, excuse me, Damien. I think somebody's smoking outside, so because um, there's tobacco smoke well coming into the room, so I'm just gonna poke my head out and um, or just do you want something to drop on them? Um, yeah. <laughs> so just see if I can see anyone at all. Representative Gonzalez, I'll go down. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you so much. So, so Damien, when it comes to when it comes to uh, an employee having to choose voluntarily to come into the program, um, what are the, can you remind us about what the, the notice requirements are? I mean, I, I'm assuming that, I'm assuming that anytime there's a change in employer employee law, there's going to be a poster or a posting in an employer's lounge or back room, but do we, I know for paid leave, we went through a process of making sure that people, um, paid sick days, that, that people knew and, and we went to some extraordinary or more thorough measures than, um, than if it were mandatory. Can you just talk yeah. about what's in the bill? And So that's a, a good question. It's actually something that I just discovered was inadvertently left out um, of the bill this time around. So the notice provision, uh, normally we would have a poster requirement and then uh, with earned sick time, um, particularly because it was a new program, we had a, a requirement that when you hire someone, you give them notice of their rights. Um, I've already drafted language um, to put that in, um, so that's something the committee could add in. The other thing that some other states have done, too, is require initial notice to be given to employees when the program starts. Um, so kind of a form notice that are, or pamphlet that's prepared by the state that lets employees know what their rights are um, and gives them notice that you know this benefit is coming you'll either get it through a private plan from the employer or through the state plan 
uh, and your employer can provide you with more details just so people know that they have that right. One of the issues that some of the early adopters had was that employees didn't know they even had the op option. Um, but that was an oversight on my part in, in drafting and was just discovered the other day. So um, that's the benefit. Of there, there, are no, there are notices that are posted for unpaid leave presently, right? There are. Um, you okay. can actually see one across the hall in the House General Committee. Are you envisioning um, a combined notice or are they going to be separate notices? I, I think that that would be left up to um, probably the Department of Labor, but traditionally they've been separate notices and they, what employers typically do is there are giant posters that combine all the legally required notices uh, and employers will get a new one of those for each year. Okay. Um, you do also have the option of doing what we did here at the legislature for a short period of time, which is going to the DOL website and printing out notices and then you fill in blanks with a pen. Um, and so we did that for a couple of years here before finally purchasing the, the posters. You have to purchase them? Usually they're pre prepared by a company that yeah. puts well, the one that we have, for you. The one that we yeah. have, which combines, I mean, if you go to the back of a restaurant, you'll see a bulletin board that looks kind of like what this bulletin board would look like, just pieces of paper posted everywhere. This combines yeah. all into a huge so, poster that yeah, so you can do it by free by just going to the DOL okay. and, and other websites mm -hmm. and printing them out, which is what I did for Ledge Council when I started working here. Okay. Um, and then uh, what we've started doing just to simplify that process each year is Mike Ferrand just, just orders it. I forget how much it costs, but it's a nominal, nominal cost. But if employers do want to save that or they're a small employer, they okay. can do a much you know, cheaper process. Okay, I would like to get through yep. everything by 11. So the next section is the appeals section, um, and this is, goes to Representative Gonzalez's question earlier. Um, so the uh, House bill had a, an appeal to an administrative law judge. Um, they actually, what the House bill provided is that the appeal would track the unemployment insurance appeals um, so the initial appeal could be to the um, private insurance carrier if there is one, and then it would track the unemployment insurance appeals for further appeals. The Senate um, modified that slightly to take the Employment Security Board, who is kind of the intermediate appeal for unemployment insurance, out of the process. Um, their oversight is really focused on unemployment insurance, so this would have required them to gain a new expertise. So there is still an administrative law judge, but then your next step um, is to go to the Vermont Supreme Court, and that's consistent with some other areas of the law, but it, it simplifies it to a three-step process to get to a final ruling instead of a four-step process. Either way, under both systems, you have um, due process for folks who get their benefits denied or who are told that they, or an employer who's told that they owe more money than they think they do. And so how does this track for um, workers' compensation or unemployment benefits? So in workers' compensation, um, there are a couple of different um, appeal routes. One is if your benefits are denied, there's an appeal process through the Department of Labor. There's also an appeal process um, which is, uh, my understanding, is not frequently utilized through the Department of Financial Regulation related to the way the insurance product is administered. Um, the, with unemployment insurance, uh, so your initial appeal is to um, sort of, you know, to the staff person at the Department of Labor. It's an appeal to the commissioner, but it's really to the staff overseeing it where it gets kicked up a level. They review your file again. It then goes to an administrative law judge. After the administrative law judge, you go to the Employment Security Board, and then it goes to the Vermont Supreme Court. Um, so those are, are similar in other employment laws. Um, you may see an inter intermediate step where it goes, uh, commissioner makes a ruling, then it goes to the Superior Court, then the Supreme Court. Um, but typically, a three-stage process is not unheard of. Um, in the employment laws. The variation, though, across the employment laws is, is pretty broad. So. Thanks. 
So next in section 581, uh, the rehiring provision, the bottom line of both provisions in the House and the Senate is the same. The Senate did a lot of work to clarify that provision after hearing concerns from um, various interested parties that it seemed to be requiring um, job protection rather than rehiring. And uh, it was based on language from the workers' comp law, which has been long understood to be a, you know, you have to reoffer a suitable job, but you're not required to pr protect the individual's job. Um, and unfortunately, that language was not very clear. And so the Senate did a lot of work to kind of clear, clarify that language. Um, and so it, it makes it very clear that you're entitled to one offer of employment in an available, suitable job, not job protection, unless you qualify for job protection under the unpaid leave law, which already exists. Which affects only employers over fifth, oh, over <coughs> 10. 10 or more if full time bill passes, If this yes. bill passes, it gets standardized to 10, not the 10 and 15 that exist mm -hmm. right now under yeah, Vermont family leave. That's roughly three quarter to full time employees, too, who have been employed for a year. Um, yeah. So it is, it is a smaller than just the pool of Vermont employers that employ 10 or more. Yeah. Okay. Um, the rulemaking, the only change was to deal with the opt-in benefit there. Otherwise, that, um, oh, and it also provided for the use of unemployment insurance information to help with the determination of eligibility for benefits. Um, and the same with the adoption of rules section, section four, um, which just sets deadlines for the adoption of rules. Uh, the UI employment insurance, or UI, um, language is going to be readdressed in section 19.2, which I'll get to in a second. The section 15, the Senate required additional reports on the RFI and RFP process. So the House had a requirement that at the end of the RFP process, there's a report back to tell us why you chose the way you did. Um, the Senate adds in a request that the RFI and the RFP be given, copies be given to the legislature, mm -hmm. and that there's an intermediate report back on the results of the RFI process as well. So it goes from one report to four. So there's an ability for the legislature to track what's happening. Um, section 16, uh, this was what I talked about earlier, pushing out uh, by one month the date for the state to report back if they don't find a suitable administrator. Um, so if the state's going to operate the program, they now have essentially two months to come up with a plan and report back rather than one month under the House bill. So so that timeline that that timeline that exists in this in, in, in the Senate bill, it's called the Senate bill for now, was sometime in July the RFP was supposed to go out there, supposed to receive, we're supposed to receive responses by sometime in August. And then there a decision, if it's a private, well, a decision otherwise, a decision whether or not this is the, a beneficial plan through the private administrator or whether we have to go to a public plan would happen, I believe the date is, is November 15th. That's correct. 20, it would have been 2020, right? Um, or it would have been 2019. Um, I just want to flag that as we move dates forward, whether or not that timeline is sufficient in 2020, or if we have to if we have to cons make considerations. It's pretty tight. Right. Well, right. I mean, it's it is. Um, I mean, I'll be open and clear. It's an election year, and there's going to be distractions across the board on on, and this is this can be used as a as a as a political talking point. And I would just assume see this program um, studied and determined of whether it's you know given its worth based on as much of the data information and as a little bit about politics as possible. So we just, I'm just putting it out there, the, the 15th may be the best date for it, um, but it just is something to flag for now. If we were to look at that, would that change cost projections when contributions start and yeah. cash sure. flow and sure um, you know the Department of Labor I'm sorry the Department of Taxes needs a certain amount of time to set up their uh, payroll collection system 
So that would move forward. And the first month premium is due the month before benefits start. So benefits move out the month of that first big payment move out. So yeah, there would be changes that could affect the fiscal year timing. Okay. Okay. Something to consider. Thank you. So sections 18 and 19 are um, really housekeeping changes. Um, in talking to the Department of Taxes and Department of Labor on the Senate side last year, uh, it became clear that we needed to add in provisions in the tax law and the UI law to allow for disclosure of information to the administrator and the other departments working here. Um, and within uh, both those cases, it has to be conditioned on certain things and confidentiality protections and so forth. Uh, and so that, that's what's added in in sections 18 and 19. Uh, and also the rulemaking sections earlier where I referenced that. Um, the section 20 is a study of transitioning from the opt-in program to a mandatory TDI program at some point in the future. Um, so that's an all new study. And then section 21 is the effective dates, which as I mentioned earlier, adds a timeline if the state ends up administering the program itself rather than finding a third party administrator. You'll notice the big gap here um, where section three and then sections five through 14 were omitted. That's because they didn't change uh, between the House and the Senate. What kind of just a last lingering question? Very last, but just on, on, on your review, you mentioned um, when when dealing with a private administrator that if the General Assembly chooses to um, go mandatory on TDI in in the future, that any contract would be reopened. That there's a provision that any contract would be reopened mm -hmm. in order to determine new rates. That is that. Did I hear that correctly? I, it, there may be other changes that are necessary to the contract. Um, so, but yeah, it would allow for the reopen of the contract in that case so that the, the administrator in the state could address whatever changes need to be made beyond just the rates are set by the state and then there's a premium paid to the administrator. Um, and so the state rates, you gotta remember, keep the state's administrative costs as well as whatever needs to go to the administrator for payment of benefits and their administrative costs. Um, so that, that's all housed in the tax rate. And then the state pays out of that to the administrator as well as funding the costs within. You know, so there's an IT cost at Department of Taxes. Um, there's uh, some administrative costs over at DOL because they have appeals that they'll need to hear. Uh, they have rulemaking that needs to be done at both those agencies. Um, DFR last year testified that they didn't foresee additional costs, um, but that could change in the future and need to be baked into that too. So, so um, when an RFP goes out, um, you mentioned to me could have been last year that there's a the process from the state when they're looking for re requests for proposals, that there are bulletins, that there are rules basically that are, that are set. What is the name of the bulletin that affects something like this, that when the, when the government sits down and says, okay, we're putting this together, they have, they have certain rules that they have to go through. What is that? That's bulletin 3.5. Uh, it's developed by the agency of administration, um, and that covers the state contracting rules. There's a similar bulletin for grants um, that you may also have heard of, which is Bulletin 5, but Bulletin 3.5 is what we're concerned with here. Okay. Um, and that, that covers uh, information that needs to be put in the bid, how the bid process is run, the requirements for contractors. So there are, um, for example, folks who contract with the state have to um, assure the state that they're complying with labor laws. Um, so that, you know, makes a lot of, uh, as you can imagine, would matter a lot in things like road construction or other services contracts. Um, here, you're still providing the insurance that you're complying with wage and hour and other labor laws, but it may be less of a concern so, for that, but yeah. So I don't think anybody wants to have any 
impediment to going to mandatory TDI if the legislature chose to do that. Is there anything in this program or in those contracts that might be set up with private entities that would get in the way of that? Or, or, or should we put something in here to make it clear that um, you know, contract the provisions? I mean, I think there is something in law or in many contracts that talk about there are changes that come from the legislature that allow for modifications of the contract. So I'm just wondering if we, if we have that in here. Right. Well, I think uh, typically your, your contract um, has to, if you're in a highly regulated area like this, your contract contemplates that it may need to change in the future. Um, the uh, trying to think. Uh, the reopener language, I think, is definitely should stay in. Um, I can take a look. Connecticut is the other state that's really done a thorough job of looking at, at this, and I can look to see if they have anything else. Okay. Um, but I mean, typically, though, it's it's assumed when you're in a highly regulated area like this that you're going to contemplate that. Uh, in the contract, um, you know, we could we could add language just saying the contract shall include provisions for making adjustments to the terms based on uh, legislative amendments that may occur during the term of the contract. Uh, so that that's a good segue. Do you have one more? I was quick. Just okay. Quick on the same title. So. Um, a bulletin 3.5 for state contracting rules, can that be found online? Can people find that online if they want to take a look at yes, it? Yes, it is at the Department of Buildings and General Services website, and okay. I can send a link to okay. Faith and uh, have her okay. forward it out to the committee or post it. Okay. That will be then, on. And the state is required to follow bulletin 3.5, and if one wants to make changes to bulletin 3.5, does that have to go to the legislature? That's done by the agency of administration. Okay. Um, so that's so, how changes get made. If, okay. Yeah. The and but yet in most cases the state has to follow bulletin three point right. five when they're doing contracting. Okay. Um, Thank you. So um, I think that's a good segue. We have five more minutes, but um, well, let's find some. Yeah. I yeah. segue to a couple of issues, at least one issue. So if it may be flipping in its on its head, but. Uh, we had some witnesses, as you did, from the state, and I'm concerned about the juxtaposition of what the state has agreed to with the VSEA and our law, and how we deal with that. Um, from the, from at least based upon what the Senate version is as a contribution rate of point two, and what the state employees negotiated as a. Um, a bump in their wages if they don't get their contracted paid family and medical leave. It seems like what they got may be a little bit more valuable than what we're offering. And I don't want to necessarily upset that apple cart. So um, we'll probably come back with a proposal on that. But I just wanted to flag that to you. Yeah, um, we'll do we'll be point by point on what I mean. Cause the review that we had from BSEA on what the language is in their contract seemed very broad, mm -hmm. but the numbers are, you know, the, the numbers I think that you're talking about would be the um, estimated, well, there's Wait, three There's three sets 20. of numbers. There's there's the actual six, six, six weeks of, six weeks of this, this, this at 60%, and then the cost being, what is it, 2.5? Estimated right. at 2.5, but then if they if the, if that program doesn't get put into place, they get a 0.25 right. pay increase right. that exactly. would be negotiated in the Pay Act, which would be, I think they said 1.5, 1, 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 4. So yeah, well, that's fine. Um, and the the other issue um, is the one that has been floating around, uh, dealing with the very low income workers who might have a qualifying event but don't have the qualifying wages. And frequently that's the case that you have to show attachment to the workforce for a certain period of time before you can qualify for a program. So I'm not sure we want to go in the direction of having somebody 
pay in five dollars and qualify for you know ten thousand dollars worth of benefits but on the other hand I don't think it's a big deal to figure out a way to make those people whole who have put in ten or twenty dollars into the program and um, not qualify financially for the program so we may have a suggestion on that as well Right. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, our understanding of again of what the benefits would be, the payout would be again. If you take the seventy-three thousand number, is this nine forty-six uh, or nine sixty-four? Um, you know, somebody, and, and so they would cap at an individual at that pay rate would cap at just under twelve thousand dollars of benefits. That's their set top benefit that they can receive. Um, obviously, someone who's making seven thousand dollars a year, seven right. three hundred dollars a year, would be making, would be capping at twelve hundred dollars a year. So, right. but yeah, if you want to propose language that addresses that in some way, and we can have that conversation. Yeah, I, I, again, we would want to check with Joyce to make sure by somehow uh, refunding their contribution that we don't. We don't want to see if that has any impact on the on the contribution the rate. Right. So um, this is a this is a priority for us to meet at least in, 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 throughout the day. Mm -hmm. um, we've kept our schedule open to whatever time frames are available. We hope you've how done about, the same. How about um, four thirty? And in the interim, if you have proposals you want to draft up, and I've mentioned two that we would draft up, uh, we can share those when we meet the next meeting. Um, 4.30 seems like a long time, but um, are you... We have caught. We have a I caucus. Know. We have, haven't now. had our caucus yet. I know, so we're missing our we're caucus missing our now, caucus. but we have we have dispensation to get this done. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if 4.30, oh. if 4.30 works to work through until until we, until we we're done working, I mean, I don't want it to be 4.30, 4.45. Um, I'm, 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 we, I'm, I'm with you on getting this done as soon as possible. So, I mean, we have some drafting to do. And uh, if we come in with some proposals, we can make some headway at 4.30. We, we could do 4.30 to 6, I think. I think 6 we'd have to be. Why would you have to stop at 6? So why don't we, why don't we get back in touch with you? Okay, good. We, we need to huddle up, the three of us, clearly. That's okay. fine. So do we. I mean, obviously yeah. we do too, but I just, I, yep. I would, if we can fit in as much time during daylight. Um, it's not daylight by 6. I know, that's right, 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 but that's why I would rather, I would, if, if the schedules can yep. be... Yeah, okay. uh, I, I think we're on the same page. Just, right. same we just need to know what our schedules yeah. are. So two of us are on finance, go. and we have much smaller, smaller committees than you have, and so it's, yeah. there are quorum issues in the afternoon, so we'll just... It was just brutal to be out of I, No, I understand. This yeah. is, I mean, this is strange for us all to be doing conference in totally. January, so... But it's a priority for both of us. But we've cleared, our, we've cleared our schedule. Well, we only have, we have four conferences in January. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Legislators.